Entrepreneur Live. Welcome to another episode of Professor and the Idiot. I'm Nick Wolfinger. I'm Amy Newberg. I'm the idiot. But we now have a better understanding of what that is. What is it? Let's let Andy Roth explain it to us. Hey, this hey. is Andy Roth, and I'm happy to be joining Nick and Amy this week on their show. And before we started recording, we were talking about Idiot, and I just learned uh, in conversation that if we go back to uh, ancient Greece and Athenian democracy, the original kind of definition of an idiot is uh, someone who didn't participate in or contribute to public life. So I'm not sure about that uh, term's applicability to the co-host of this podcast, but it's certainly interesting in light of um, recent current events, what the last three, four years, where uh, many people have, have been inclined uh, to refer to uh, the president of the United States as an idiot, not as uh, a term of slander, but as a literal description. And, and perhaps, that, uh, perhaps that fits with, uh, you know, insofar as the original meaning of the term is someone who's disconnected from public life. Um, and focused and, on the self. And focused, uh, yeah, uh, monomaniacally on the self. Um, uh, perhaps the term sticks with new residents. As an idiot. But, 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 but he certainly does participate in American <laughs> life. Yes. Uh, <laughs> he is, I think, uh, certainly America's most solipsistic president. But he's still participating. So maybe we just want to call him a non-Athenian idiot. Is that better? Or yeah. Worse? Well, I mean, I think I think again, I'm no expert on Athenian democracy, much less ancient Greek. The hell you're not. But the term, but the term would write. I've I've looked up terms on the internet. Um, the I, I think the idea was you're right. Participating in public life with the implication of being in a positive and constructive way. In other words, demonstrating social responsibility, um, not being, uh, you know, being something the opposite of uneducated or ignorant. Uh, so can we segue from being uneducated and ignorant into it, having Andy educate us? <laughs> but first, who is Andy? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, he has been my friend for 30 years. We attended graduate school in sociology together at UCLA. Uh, he is here not only as our friend, but also because he is the associate director of a media watchdog group called Project Censored. Uh, Project Censored uh, reports on the stories that the mainstream and corporate media fails to report on. But that's a far shittier introduction than Andy will provide. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think, Nick, you've done a, a, a good job. Thank you for that introduction. And, and um, um, uh, it's one of the great um, satisfactions of my life that uh, graduate school at UCLA, which was arduous and something I wanted to end as quickly as possible in many ways, uh, brought us together as friends and therefore has connected me to people like Amy. Um, but Project Censored uh, started at Sonoma State University in 1976 when a professor there, Carl Jensen, uh, was asked by a student, um, how is it that Richard Nixon could get reelected when Watergate had already been reported? The scandal of Watergate was public knowledge. And yet on the night that Richard Nixon was reelected, there was no mention whatsoever of Watergate or the political scandal, arguably the greatest political scandal of the 20th century for the United States, uh, received no mention uh, on any of the major TV networks the night that they were reporting on Richard Nixon's reelection. You're selling Teapot Dome short, but I digress. <laughs> oh, you, fair enough, fair enough. Anyway, in terms of the Project Censored sort of founding story, Carl didn't feel he had a satisfactory answer to that student's question. Uh, but what it spurred him to do was to engage the students in that class in, in beginning to look critically at what the, um, at what the, at the time, Carl would refer to as the mainstream press. We now talk about it in terms of being the establishment or the corporate press. Uh, what 
what they were covering and what they were failing to cover. And the kind of counterpoint uh, for Carl was to look, to, to compare and contrast what the mainstream media, the major networks, the, the newspapers, the national newspapers of record, um, what they were reporting compared and contrast with what independent news outlets uh, were covering. And Carl's students began to dig these stories and to look for the stories that independent news outlets were covering and that the corporate news media uh, were either not covering or covering in a, a partial way where partial could mean either incomplete or biased. Um, and out of that began uh, what I think most people who know about Project Censored know it for, which is an annual listing of the 25 most important but underreported stories. Uh, and so these stories, so Project Censored, a lot of people stumble on the name and they say, oh, well, there's not really censorship. There's especially not really government censorship in the United States, not like we have in China or other authoritarian countries. And in some sense, that's true, uh, although that's something we might want to discuss more during this conversation. Um, but censorship, as we understand it at Project Censored, is anything that interferes with the free flow of information in a society that purports, as ours does, uh, to have a free press. And so these stories are censored, not in the sense of that there's a government official saying, you can't print that, you cannot broadcast that. There are the mechanisms by which they, these stories fail to garner a wide audience, fail to receive the attention they receive. There, there are many reasons, but the basic point of the project is every year we can come up with at least several dozen, if not several hundred stories of significant importance that have in effect been buried altogether or significantly marginalized by the establishment media to the disservice of the American public and ultimately, I think, to the disservice, to the, to the weakening of our democracy. Uh, can you explain the structure of the publication? Is it, do you reprint the articles that you have found or do you rephrase them? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, so our process is a kind of a year-long process of, of uh, students who participate in the project through what we call our campus affiliates program. Um, so these are college students at about two dozen college and university campuses across the United States uh, who are taking classes with faculty who are affiliated uh, informally with Project Censored. Uh, the students are involved initially in, in going out and searching for and identifying underreported stories, or at least what might be candidates for, as underreported stories. Um, and they, so there's a kind of a year long uh, identification and vetting process to find these stories that are being covered in the corporate press and ignored or marginalized or distorted in the, I'm sorry, being covered in the independent press and being distorted or marginalized. Um, or just ignored altogether in the corporate media and to, and to check the quality of those stories to make sure that the, we aren't missing any uh, corporate coverage. And ultimately, we go through a voting process that involves um, the faculty and students who are involved and the project has a panel of 28-some um, international experts who serve as our judges. We have everything from former FCC commissioners to um, uh, journalists and editors, uh, media scholars, um, and they vote to ultimately rank the stories. Those stories then come out um, in the form of a book um, that is published by Seven Stories Press, an independent publisher out of New York City that the project has been associated with for literally as long as we've been producing a book, which now it's something like the project was established in 1976 so we're a little over 40 years old and the, we've been producing a book for close to 30 some of those years um, so we're really proud of our affiliation with seven stories press that stands by us and basically lets us publish whatever we want as long as we've got the facts to back it up is there also an online version yeah, uh, all the stories, all the top 25 stories this year, going all the way back to 1976, uh, all those top 25 stories are archived online. Uh, and what's archived there, to go back to your initial question, Amy, is we present a summary analysis of the story um, that highlights the most important points 
Uh, one of the challenges, I think, for people today when it comes to being uh, sort of news literate is there's so much information out there and it's overwhelming and there's not enough time to cover, you know, you could spend all day reading and watching the news and still not have seen everything that you might feel like you ought to know to be an informed, engaged citizen. So the summaries provide kind of a capsule highlight of, the, of a story's most important points. Um, it all, the stories that, the summaries that we provide also um, include an assessment of the extent to which the story's been covered in the corporate media. Um, and then we include uh, online links back to the original reporting, the original independent reporting that the Project Censored Summary is based on. And in the book, we have those as bibliographic citations. So if people listening would like to access th this, is there a way for them to do it? Yep, go to Project Censored, all one word, project and censored.org, and you will find on the home page displayed fairly prominently uh, on a kind of moving banner towards the top of that web page, um, one of the one of the the links with a big uh, dramatic picture attached to it is this year's top twenty five list, and if you scroll down to the footer of the home page. Um, you'll find a link uh, for the top 25 archive, the historical archive of the top 25. And they're all there free of charge because we, that's part of our mission is to um, inform the public about the importance of independent investigative reporting for democracy, but also to cultivate a kind of a public appreciation of and support for independent media. And has that happened? <laughs> well, we're still at it. So I think, you know, uh, one answer to that question is, you know, uh, Mickey Huff, who's the director of the project, uh, and I, uh, we co-edit the book every year. And we always joke, like, one of these years, wouldn't it be great to go out of business, to not have any stories that are being buried or distorted by the corporate media? Um, well, you know, that's sort of the dream in some ways. Uh, but so far, you know, I've been working with the project since about 2005, 2006, and there's never been a year in the time that I've been involved in the project that we've had fewer than, say, a couple hundred candidate stories for each 12-month cycle. So, Well, have you at least managed to elevate some of those stories into the... Uh, yes, yes, that's, that has happened. Uh, another feature of the book... Um, that we do almost every year. We have a chapter in the book called Deja Vu News, where we go back and look at stories that the project has covered in previous yearbooks. And we assess the extent to which that story may have broken through to wider public attention um, and the extent to which there have been important developments um, in the story itself since Project Censored initially reported on it. So, yeah, there are, there are examples of this uh, with some regularity, um, but it's always difficult to know, you know, my training as a sociologist at UCLA is, you know, instilled in me a kind of a cautiousness about, about uh, claiming causal relationships. And just because a story breaks through to wider public attention after Project Censored has covered it doesn't mean Project Censored can necessarily take credit for having generated that wider public attention. Right. Um, do, but do you, do you push the publication at the mainstream press? I mean, do, do you try to sort we of... We do. I mean, we, you know, I think, I don't know if it's something we should be chagrined by or proud of, but uh, in the 40 some years that the project has existed, I don't believe we've ever been mentioned once by name in the New York Times. Uh, you know, my personal take is there's a kind of anxiety of influence then dynamic there. Um, I've long thought that if I was a young up and coming reporter trying to make a name for myself, that I would keep track of the stories that Project Censored is following as underreported stories and try to, um, you know, hitch, hitch onto one of those and write it into, uh, you know, widespread mainstream public attention. Um, who, who does read it? Do you know who uh, your readers are? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we have all kinds of readers. Uh, a, a lot of them are uh, students in the classes that I was mentioning earlier, the college and university classes where Project Censored is part of their curriculum. Um, and that's across 
all different um, disciplines. It's not only students who are taking, say, journalism or communications courses. Um, I've taught for years sociology courses that include a media and news component, and I would have my students digging um, digging stories for Project Censored during that component of, say, an introduction to sociology course. But outside of academia, um, you know, the the book is marketed by our publisher as, uh, you know, a current affairs type book, um, politics and such. And uh, so I think a more general audience of people, probably most of them progressive in their political uh, uh, outlook, um, follow the project. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting, the project, um, because of our kind of contrarian position, because of how we question official narratives, the project attracts people not only from kind of the progressive left, but also a certain kind of um, skeptical reader from a, a, a more um, like libertarian right perspective as well. Um, so we... You know, when we have public events, it's often interesting to see the kinds of questions that that uh, participants in the audience for these events want to ask. And they often, you know, they often hew to what you might expect of a kind of a media watchdog organization out of Northern California. But um, there is that there is that kind of libertarian streak that that draws together, you know, you kind of imagine the the two outer wings of a left and a right wing perspective bending together and meeting at some point when we talk about civil liberties and, and um, protection, protection of civil liberties. Why do you think these stories, this is a, probably an unanswerable question, why do you think these stories are buried in the mainstream press? That's a, I mean, that's a great question. And I think in some ways it's one of those unanswerable questions that is nonetheless well worth um, um, chewing on and thinking about. Um, there are different kinds of answers, I think, to that question. Some of them are theoretical. Um, so some of them come out of, of critical media theory. Um, so, for instance, the, the work of uh, Ed Herman, who I believe was there at Cal Berkeley for Wait. many years. Many Ed, years. Ed Short Fuse Herman, the light heavyweight fighter in the UFC. <laughs> no, this would be Edward Edward, I believe, S. Herman, uh, who uh, co-authored with Noam Chomsky the famous book Manufacturing Consent. Oh, okay. In 1986, uh, I have no doubt that the Ed Herman that I know uh, it was probably a probably could you know be a pretty tough fighter uh, in close quarters intellectually. Um, but Herman and Chomsky put together a propaganda model um, that had five filters. And the argument was that these filters on their own and together uh, produced a kind of homogenous, homogenized news that, that um, has a kind of hegemonic effect. It, it produces and reproduces the existing order of things. And so they argued that everything from the influence of advertising money to uh, the consolidation of media ownership in the hands of a few corporate entities to um, the kinds of sources that journalists consistently turn to for uh, as, as both newsworthy actors and newsworthy sources of information. Um, the, uh, the way in which uh, flack negative response to certain kinds of coverage uh, creates disincentives for covering stories. And then uh, they looked at how, so the theoretical, the fifth element of the theoretical model, they initially defined in terms of anti-communism, but in subsequent versions of the propaganda model, Herman and Chomsky uh, revised that to talk about it more generally in terms of fear so they could so they could uh, address, for instance, after the fall of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, they could talk about how um, fear of Muslims was used to manipulate news content. So the propaganda model has been very unpopular with most kind of mainstream communications theorists and even sociologists of news media. Uh, Michael Shudson, a very prominent um, uh, sociologist of the history of journalism is all but dismissive of the propaganda model. Um, 
But when you look at the kind of, as Amy was alluding to earlier, when you look at not just individual stories that make up our top 25 lists each year, but when you look at the, the whole of them, which is now a body of 1100 some stories, and you look at the contents of those stories, they hew pretty closely to the kind of propaganda model, the five filters that Herman and Chomsky um, first identified back now 35 some years ago. So I, the other kind of answer to that question, I think uh, to make it more concrete, a student of mine when I was teaching at the College of Marin about six years ago, a student of mine was working on a story about how the, in the year 2012 had been designated by the United Nations as the International Year of the Cooperative. That, that, um, and the projections were, and I won't be able to get the figures right from memory here, but the projections were but that by the year 2030 or so, cooperatively owned businesses, in other words, worker owned, worker uh, operated businesses would be the fastest business growing model in the, uh, in the in the world and that story we found as we dug into the corporate news media coverage of it received almost no coverage whatsoever is it true yeah which about the growth of the growth i think of, I, I i uh i couldn't give you a definitive answer without you know zipping around the internet a little bit and and doing some updating on my right. knowledge of that story right. um but the point was at the time there was, you know, the United Nations didn't just blithely announce that. They had some basis for projecting that, that uh, growth. Um, and what we found was that the corporate news media had, had not covered that story at all. So, you know, it's, it's uh, interesting. You can't prove definitively that what I'm about to say is true, but, but you know, it seems sort of a matter of common sense uh, analysis that, well, it's not really in the corporate news media's interest to report on a business model that is in direct competition with how they're organized and with the entire kind of world view that, that uh, you know, dare I say, a whole corporate capitalist uh, uh, conception of order is based on. So, you know, that's, I, you know, I know, Nick, you'll be skeptical of that as a kind of macro explanation. Um, but I do think there are a number of stories where you can see something like um, a conflict between the interests of the corporate owned entities that report most of the news that we receive and the business interests of those entities. So, for instance, out of, you know, we're coming up on the 10 year anniversary of the Fukushima disaster in a little more than half a year, this nine months or so. Um, and, uh, you know, the coverage of that at the time, NBC was still owned, I believe, by General Electric. General Electric had uh, not built, but they had provided the plans for the nuclear reactors that uh, failed uh, catastrophically. Uh, when the tsunami uh, hit that coast of Japan. And, uh, you know, you can look and see how um, coverage of the Fukushima disaster is probably shaded by the fact that, uh, you know, that there's that business relationship between GE and NBC. So are there examples in this year's collection of, of that kind of conflict? Um, or we can we can just sort of go into some of the contents. Yeah, for yeah, sure. I have I, a variety of notes about specific stories. Okay, yeah. If there's stories you want to talk about, otherwise, I'll, you know, I'll dive into some of my favorites. But I'm happy to. Uh, Why don't you dive in yeah. and talk about the ones that really are they are they in order of importance or? Are yeah. They so the stories the the stories I mentioned earlier that we have this panel of international and nationally known judges and um, the final round of voting involves the judges uh, voting so as to rank order the stories. So the number one story is in some sense, you know, what we at Project Censored have deemed to be the most important but underreported story. But that's where, you know, I think candidly, uh, 
I think everyone involved in the project would, would say like, well, there are limitations to lists, right? How, you know, how much, how much more important is the Justice Department's secret FISA rules for targeting journalists, which was our number one story in the censored 2020 yearbook, our most recent book, how much more important is that story than um, say the number six story that survivors of sexual abuse and sex trafficking are often criminalized for acts of self-defense. Right, importance you, is obviously hard to. Yeah, you can't, you, you, yeah. you know, how do you, I'm holding my hands <laughs> as, if, as if measuring scales and, you know, I think, so I think the idea is that uh, the list serves certain functions in terms of generating attention for the release of these stories. You know, in some sense, we're, we're subverting a, a, a mass media staple. Everyone loves year-end lists, right? The top 10 of 2020, this, that, and the other, right? Allow um, me to quote one of my favorite lines from The Simpsons, which was a mm. room conversation, where someone says, so what's better, Muhammad Ali in his prime or anti-lock breaks? <laughs> <laughs> They'll both stop you in your tracks. Right, right. <laughs> I yeah. Think that, yeah, that, right, yeah, that right. So I mean, I think the list, the list thing uh, is, uh, is uh, you know, a sort of a delivery mechanism. And it does represent something like a collective judgment of a fairly well-informed group of people. But, but I, you know, I think what's important is that rather than the position of any one story on the list, I would say the, the thing that people should take away from the annual list is that every year we can come up with 25 stories that most people reading the book will, or seeing the stories online will go something like the definition, you know, one of, in grad school, I learned one of the definitions of a good news story is journalists call a holy shit story where you right. read the story and you go holy shit i can't believe that's true right and every year we can come up with 25 stories that in my perhaps prejudiced opinion are holy shit stories where you you do a double holy shit in the sense that you say i can't believe that's true and i can't believe that story didn't get didn't get widespread coverage i can't believe that it's only a reporter at Mint Press News, or only a reporter at Consortium News, or only someone from um, you name the independent news outlet that was tracking that story. Well, let's, can we dig in? Yeah. All right. Tell us about the most important story. Uh, the Justice Department's secret FISA rules for targeting journalists was our number one story from this year. So I think one reason this story ends up being number one is it's a story about um, in some sense, it's a story about threats to journalistic integrity, which is obviously for a, a you know a news monitoring organization. Those are those are core stories for us. Um, so this story goes back to um, 2015 and a pair of memos that were sent by the then Attorney General Eric Holder to uh, the National Security Division of the Department of Justice, um, authorizing. Basically, the memo's indicating that the court, um, the government could use court orders under FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, to monitor the communications of journalists and news organizations. Now, that's a departure from what has been standard practice. The, the Justice Department historically has had fairly strict guidelines for uh, what's necessary in terms of subpoenas, court orders, and warrants to follow journalists and their work, their communications in that way. And the FISA court basically, um, which was established in 1978, with the purpose of processing requests by federal law enforcement intelligence agencies to surveil and search and engage in other kinds of investigative actions for foreign intelligence purposes, is basically being used to uh, you know, kind of a loophole method of uh, getting at journalists. And, and so supposedly it would, the, these FISA court orders that then Attorney General Holder was authorizing would only involve journalists who possessed foreign intelligence information. But the way these, uh, this guidance is worded, um, there's a lack of clarity on the circumstances when 
either a journalist or their source might be considered the agent of a foreign power. So, um, for instance, reporters who were working for RT America, um, including Abby Martin, who's been a longtime ally of um, the RT project. Amer RT America is a Russian owned and uh, news source with uh, that Putin's heavy hand directing it. Some of that is debatable, but but it is certainly a Russian uh, a, a Russian state. Um, so uh, what, what reporters, including American yeah. reporters working for RT America, yeah. had to register with the State Department yeah. um, uh, under uh, uh, under some of the guidance out of this. Um, and uh, but no one was doing the same, Nick. Uh, for journalists working for the BBC, right? But Russia is a Russia is a hostile power. And yes. Russia yes. Yeah. Right. But the journalists who work for Russia are not necessarily hostile. Uh, or and and you know this is there is room for debate on this. But um, the idea that just because you work for RT, you're the tool of Putin is uh, you know that runs afoul of some fairly well entrenched protections of freedom of the press in the United States. So this is a story that as we dug into it, we found, um, you know, this, so I should give some credit where credit's due. Um, um, some of our sources on this story are the Freedom of the Press Foundation, but uh, in terms of the journalism, um, uh, Cora Courier from The Intercept, uh, Jessica Corbett at Mint Press News, and uh, perhaps no surprise, RT also uh, reported on this story. So, the questions that remain, the questions that, as I understand it, remain unanswered today are how many times uh, FISA court orders have been used to target journalists. Um, and when, and back in 2015, when the Justice Department was updating its media guidelines, um, why it chose not to make any mention of um, the plans to use the FISA court orders. Um, and, and then the, the bottom line, I think, really on this story um, is that it, it appears to be that using the FISA courts is a way to get around the Justice Department's much more strict media guidelines. So this is a, this, I think, you know, recalling the voting process when judges were um, casting their votes and adding their commentary on this story, I think everyone agreed this was a fundamental threat to journalistic integrity that almost no one knew about because as high quality as outlets like The Intercept and Mint Press News are, um, they, have, they have minuscule audiences compared to, you know, the evening network news shows or the USA Today even. When you say target journalists, what does that mean? Well, they can access uh, can access their communications, right? They're, and so this is part of a broader discussion that has, you know, a broader public discussion about the extent to which the government has rights to access our communications. And this is stuff that was brought to widespread public attention by Edward Snowden. Um, Right in terms of government surveillance, and the official line has always been, "Well, you're not your communications aren't surveilled in any substantive way unless you have uh, contact with foreign people, um, contact not, with ju ju not just foreign people, right? Foreign people who are already of in of interest." Uh, yeah, or, but I mean, yeah. there's ambiguity. Yeah, about yeah, that. I agree. There's I ambiguity agree. about yeah. that. There's, I mean, there's, you yeah. know, because we know, I mean, partly because of Snowden's revelations, we know that what the government was claiming they were doing and what they were actually doing were divergent. They were two different things. Yes. Um, oh, so, yeah, certainly. So, I, I mean, I think in I terms of, in terms of this story, yeah. um, the idea that, that we're going to use these vague categories, right? That they can, that you know, uh, known media entities, known members of the media, um, and what, you, how we define who is an agent of a foreign power, right? These baggy terms are ways of kind of prying open what has been 
for most of the history of the United States, this privileged relationship between journalists and their sources. And that's a threat. That means, so, so I think one way the threat manifests, Amy, is that if you're a savvy source and you have dangerous information, you may think twice about sharing it with a journalist because that mm. communication may no longer be uh, sacrosanct. I see, yeah. It would be, it would be like, for instance, um, you know, there is a similar kind of relationship between uh, a patient and their therapist or a patient and their medical care professional, right? Um, and if you break that down, if you yeah, say, look, anything you tell your doctor could become public, um, people may be much less inclined to talk about things that they consider to be delicate, that they know might be damaging to their, to their public reputation or their livelihood. Mm. Let me play devil's advocate. The press is the enemy of the people. <laughs> uh, yeah, the dangers of that. Um, uh, let's move up from, you know, uh, from, from uh, memos sent by the Attorney General in 2015. Um, I think we're seeing some of the bitter fruit of the president re recurrently referring to the press in those terms as enemy of the people. I think we're seeing some of the bitter harvest of that um, in the events of the, the national protests um, following the killing of George Floyd. Um, let, me, let me rattle off some numbers uh, here. Um, First, a background number as context is kind of set a baseline. Um, the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker and the Committee to Protect Journalists are two organizations that regularly monitor um, uh, press freedom violations, especially in the United States, um, but they are both organizations that monitor globally. So in the United States in last year, 2019, U.S. Press Freedom Tracker and the Committee to Protect Journalists documented 150 press freedom violations. That's in all of 2019. In the week between May 26 and June 3rd, the same organizations were tracking no fewer than 279 press freedom incidents. Uh, those included more than 45 assaults, I'm sorry, more than 45 arrests of journalists more than 149 assaults by police on journalists, 40 instances of equipment being damaged. Um, and in those assaults, 60, uh, I'm sorry, 40 some, 42 of those assaults were physical attacks, 40 involved uh, police tear gassing journalists, 23 involved journalists being pepper sprayed by law enforcement, and another 69 were involving rubber bullets uh, and other kind of non-lethal, quote, non-lethal projectiles. Um, and as the Committee to Protect Journalists and others have reported, in dozens of those instances, there's video evidence showing that the journalists who were so attacked yeah. were clearly journalists. They, were, they had prominently displayed press badges. They were carrying professional, you know, camera and microphone uh, equipment. Um, and there's a pretty clear indication that, that law enforcement officers were attacking the journalists as journalists. So to go back to, you know, the press is the enemy of the people, I would say in terms of the, you know, the data from one week of protests shows that uh, at the very least, law enforcement, and this is, these are in cities around the United States. This is not just in the Minneapolis, uh, 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 not just the protests at Minneapolis. Police are, are at least informally taking cues from a president who has consistently demonized the press. Uh, and to take a longer term historical perspective, I mean, that phrase, enemy of the people, um, as applied to the press, the historical antecedents for that uh, are, are uh, you know, the totalitarian dictators that are infamous from the Second World War, Mussolini, um, Hitler, and uh, Stalin. Stalin. Yeah, Stalin, that phrase was used repeatedly in the uh, Stalin's purges in the late 30s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I 
a couple of comments. First of all, uh, a journalist named Lin, independent journalist named Linda Torado, uh, who wrote one of the best books of, about poverty I've read in recent years, lost an eye to a rubber bullet recently. Mm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that's horrific, right? Yeah, in the yeah. line. Of, so these are the kinds of things that I think most Americans feel like, oh, well, you know, we know that journalists around the world, we know it's, we know it's a deadly business to be in journalism in Mexico, say, right? Or you don't really want to be a dissident journalist in Turkey these days, right? right? And I think most Americans kind of know, and at some level accept that, you know, uh, the, the business of reporting the news is dangerous in countries like that. I don't think most Americans are aware of the extent to which, you know, uh, telling dissident stories in the United States is potentially life-threatening um, in, in the United States for reporters based here. Um, so, so let me, um, let me continue on with the story about the FISA courts and the journalists. First of all, I I, you know, I, of course, I agree with you about how it has insidious implications. Mm -hmm. uh, that having been said, uh, as a partisan, uh, knowing how the extent to which uh, Russia is invested in seeing Trump reelected, a uh, part of me is uh, not unhappy that Russia, to, uh, the people who write for Russia today, are being investigated. It's mm, not mm -hmm. a great precedent, but you know, if it's happening, you know, if my team is doing it, I'm a mm -hmm. little more, you know, I'm, you know, I'll be at least ambivalent about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think that kind of instrumental uh, attitude is 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 risky. It's a risky stance. Um, I think I think without opening what to me is one of the bigger cans of worms in terms of kind of official narratives as promoted in say the Washington Post and the New York Times um, and and you know what people who I'm collegial with through my work at the project would say um, I think it's it, it, it's very unclear to me the the demonizing of russia as the threat to our electoral system is uh is on target to the extent that many people many many uh progressives and liberals believe um and i know for instance mark crispin miller one of the project's judges who's a professor of of media and communications at new york university i know that mark crispin miller for example has made the argument that liberals today liberals and many progressives today are basically running a McCarthyite kind of perspective, uh, uh, operating, um, I should say, operating from a kind of McCarthyite perspective on Russia. Um, so the very arguments that during the Cold War, right, uh, in, the in the 1960s, right. that any kind of agitation in the streets, whether it was the Black Power Movement or the anti-war movement, or the women's right movement was somehow back in the 1960s was somehow the result of external agitation by Russian operatives. Right. Right. right? And right. and and Mark Crispin Miller, whose whose views I respect, I don't. I'm not necessarily sure I agree with him 100 percent on this, but I certainly take very seriously any kind of analysis he puts forward. His argument is that liberals and progressives in the United States today are are using a similar kind of faulty logic to demonize Russia when we're not taking a, 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 an equally hard look at flaws in our own uh, uh, electoral system and the ways in which corporate money in the U.S. have have very clearly like oh yeah yeah uh, distorted yeah. so yeah. that in in some sense the whole thing becomes uh, uh, an operation of of um, smoke and mirrors to distract attention from underlying problems that are internal to the country and require no external provocation or, or um, and that's not to say that there isn't Russian interference. It's just to, it's to raise the question that I think is a valid one of, are we, are we barking up the right tree when we focus as, for instance, say Rachel Maddow has done obsessively 
right. on the role of Russia in, in all of this activity. Wait, what, which has a greater relative impact, in other words, uh, all, the, all the rich people giving to super PACs, mm -hmm. Russia. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, this yeah. is where I think part of me, I, I would say that some of my training and background as a sociologist shapes my world view on this. And I think in terms of, you know, I spent years as an undergraduate reading Marx and Engels and talking about the material conditions and the, and the means of production um, and, uh, and thinking about things like this in terms of political economy. And so I think, you know, a, a, a kind of a contemporary parallel and not to take us down an entirely different pathway. Um, I, I'm personally thrilled by um, seeing the statues of these Confederate leaders toppled and set on fire and thrown in rivers and, and the like. Um, I think uh, as symbolic acts, those are incredibly important activities. But if I had to take my pick between that and say getting single payer healthcare, I'd go with single payer healthcare every time. <laughs> so I, again, I don't want to, you know, it's kind of like talking about, well, which one is more important? Yeah. Um, I, I think one is more important than the other, but that's not to say the statue toppling is irrelevant. It's just that we need both. You know, so going back to the, the FISA court, right, the number one story uh, about the Justice Department's secret rules for targeting journalists is not exclusively about targeting journalists who work for RT. This is targeting all journalists, right. anyone, any journalist who has a foreign connection. And that's a dangerous thing. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, and so, there. you know, the Knight Institute, which is one of the, uh, one of the entities that tracks uh, uh, civil rights issues, um, this, a staff attorney for the Knight Institute, Ramya Krishnan, uh, summarized it, the stakes this way, um, that, and I'm quoting here directly, national security surveillance authorities confer extraordinary powers. The government's failure to share more information about them damages journalists' ability to protect their sources and jeopardizes the news gathering process. If there's a problem with particular journalists from RT um, or any other outlet, I think there are ways uh, within the the guidelines that the Justice Department has to 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 examine those. But but two things. Um, one is it's very clear from numerous Supreme Court decisions, all grounded back to the the component of the First Amendment that protects freedom of the press, that any kind of government interference in the ability of journalists to do their job is is ultimately contrary to our interests as a democratic society. Um, and that's why it's unconstitutional. Um, and the other is, I think, as I, as I, just to reiterate, like if there are problems nonetheless with particular types of reporting, you don't use this, this broad and, and basically- uh, Shadowy. Yeah. yeah, shadowy, yeah. completely, yeah. beyond shadowy. Like it's, except for, you know, the reporters who use the Freedom of Information Act to get a hold of these guidelines and these memos, um, we wouldn't know anything about this. Yeah. I think people might want to hear, um, we could talk at, at this length about every single one of these. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like we should just get, give people a, a little taste of some of the other things that you cover here. I'm looking at the table of contents. Yeah. I'm just going to read a few of them that's stand out. Uh, think tank partnerships establish Facebook as a tool of U.S. foreign policy. We have a couple of articles about modern slavery and sexual abuse mm -hmm. that's underreported, um, flawed investigations of sexual assaults in the immigrant shelters. Uh, U.S. women face prison sentences for miscarriages. Can you tell us something about that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so this is this is one of these kind of scary stories that is that is dramatically underreported, and uh, partly because uh, where this is happening is uh, most frequently in states that are not centers of media attention. Um, so this is uh, initial reporting that um, from um, Ms. Magazine is the core the basis, uh, and lawmakers in states across the country are enacting laws that that potentially criminalize women when they have miscarriages or stillbirths. Um, so in Alabama, voters passed a measure that would endow fetuses with personhood 
um, meaning that anything that impacts the fetus could be subject to criminal prosecution. Um, in Arkansas, a woman was convicted of concealing a birth. Uh, uh, in Mississippi, uh, this case did actually get some more widespread uh, uh, news coverage. Um, Rennie Gibbs faced murder and manslaughter charges uh, because at the age of 16, she uh, had a stillborn child. And a jury found that, the, that um, Gibbs's drug use, uh, quote, willfully and feloniously resulted in the death of the child even though experts had testified during the case that the drugs were not the cause of death. Mm. Um, so you have experts on this, on, on this topic, um, people like Lynn Paltrow, who's the director of the National Advocates for Pregnant Women, uh, talking about how laws like these, court decisions like this are in effect creating a new unique kind of gender-based form of crime, right? Uh, it's gender-based and unique in the sense that it requires a pregnancy to become a, 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 a potential criminal of this type. Right. Only now, of course, in, in the current context where we're, you know, the, the nation is uh, perhaps finally long overdue beginning to reckon with uh, its, you know, terrible history of uh, institutional racism and and deeply rooted economic inequality um, on this story you know the impacts of legislation like in Alabama and decisions like those in Arkansas and Mississippi is of course multiplied for uh, for low-income women and women of color because those those categories of people are likely to have less access to birth control and other forms of health care and they also have fewer resources to avoid um, incarceration to pay the fines or fees that are necessary to get out on bail, for instance. Um, so this is a story, this is one of these stories where I feel like, thank you for asking about it, Amy, because I feel like this is one of those stories that you go, how can this not be a major, major news story? I, um, and I think this is, I think this is one where it's a, it's, it's a connect the dots problem. It's a forest for the trees problem. I think that, you know, we did find when we reviewed this story, we did find that in December of 2018, the New York Times in its magazine section ran a major, a fairly major and deep story uh, called A Woman's Rights. But other than that, the coverage that we located on this story was mostly sporadic and episodic in kind of its focus. Uh, sporadic and episodic in the sense of it would, the reports would be about, you know, it would be just about Rennie Gibbs case in Mississippi or just about Ann Minam's case in Arkansas, or just about the, the electoral outcome in Alabama. Um, and it was only Naomi Randolph, the reporter at Ms. Magazine, that was kind of connecting the dots and saying, no, no, see the bigger picture, right? What appears to be individual isolated incidents is actually a part of a, of a larger um, systemic kind of crackdown on women's rights, women's rights to choose. Yeah. And it's not a crackdown that's necessarily being like coherently orchestrated or manipulated by any kind of, like it's not a conspiracy type thing in the sense of, oh, these people are in charge and they're doing this, but it's happening systemically nonetheless. Nick, did you have a question? Uh, not at this time. But thank you for thinking of my needs. Okay, it sounded like you were going to say something. Um, I, and I just, I want to point out also to people that some of these stories are positive. Yeah, yes, yes. We like to talk about wait, positive news stories. Wait, there's such a thing as positive news? That's an oxymoron. <laughs> no, well, yeah. I mean, traditional definitions of news typically exclude anything that you might think of as as um, uh, good news or, or solutions. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that journalists are, you know, uh, conventionally journalists as professionals are supposed to be object objective, which means whatever their own personal views are, they keep them out of it. They aren't supposed to be advocates, right? It's the kind of the, the old detective, you know, hard-boiled detective, just the facts. Right. Type attitude, right? 
Um, but there, but you know, that's a way in which the mainstream, the so-called mainstream, yes. the kind of corporate version of journalism is lagging behind um, some of the cutting edge of independent of independent reporting. Where for a long time, going back at least in the UK, going back to the 80s, and I think in the US, I would say the early 90s. Um, something it goes under different names depending on who and where you're talking. Uh, but so something like solutions journalism is um, one of the most important, I think, developments in, uh, you know, kind of contemporary news reporting. Um, and it's the idea that we can report in meaningful ways on stories that are good news stories. And just to be quick and clear to clarify, good yeah. news stories aren't it's not, oh, the cat was stuck in the tree and the fire department came and rescued the cat. It's progress right. being made on like scientific developments. and right. Yes, and stories of communities coming together and organizing to address systemic problems that they face as communities. So right? us, you, um, have, you have a so, story here about some progress being, being made on coral reef. Yes, right. So that's a great example of scientific kind of progress, right? Scientists are learning that they can, through the use of electrical currents, they can actually dramatically accelerate um, the regrowth of coral reefs that have been damaged by uh, bleaching as a result of, uh, of uh, temperature change in the ocean and, and more broadly climate change. So that's, you know, that's the kind of story where why wouldn't we want that story to circulate widely? Um, it I, hasn't circulated widely. Um, and so part of the project's mission is to say, let, you know, on the small platform that we have, we're trying to boost up and elevate into public awareness stories like that. I, I actually did hear this about this one on um, the science program on NPR. Oh, great. Just, just yeah. so you know. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we have an interesting one after it about a blueprint to reform all, before even all of the... Um, police brutality protests. We mm -hmm. had some news about reforming excess policing in schools. Yes, this one is a massive story uh, that uh, based out of uh, Northern California, a school district where there was all kinds of discrimination. I'm going to go into a little more detail on this one if, if, it, if, if you don't mind. No, no, um, go for it. This is so this is reporting that uh, first came out in Yes Magazine, which is one of, has been one of the pioneers in the United States of solutions journalism. They're based here uh, in Bainbridge Island in, uh, in Seattle. Um, yeah, so in 2019, uh, in early 2019, the California State Court had ruled that the Stockton Unified School District had to rein in its use of so-called school resource officers, which was basically the euphemistic term for cops in the schools. Um, and the court had uh, ordered a th basically a three-year investigation into widespread abuses in the policing of Stockton schools. They found over and over uh, use of excessive force, unconstitutional searches and seizures, sometimes using dogs, uh, and frequent arrests that often targeted students as young as nine years old and under. Arrests, not school discipline. They were arrested. So minor student misbehaviors that might be characteristic of, of student populations in many schools were treated in the Stockton Unified School District as criminal offenses. This is, doesn't sound like a good news story so far, I realize. <laughs> um, you know, uh, just one more bit to kind of set the yeah, stage. Yeah. So black students who are aged 10 or more were 148% more likely to be arrested than other right. students in the Stockton Unified School District. So while the Stockton district was under investigation, arrests dropped by 75%. Um, so just the fact that the investigation was going on had a kind of reigning in effect on some of the worst offenses. Um, and ultimately the, the California state court ruled that the district would have to uh, introduce clear policies and procedures for when and how administrators would refer students to law enforcement. They would have to re reform the use of force policies. They would have to assure that the searches and seizures that students were subject to were not in violation of students' Fourth Amendment rights. That sounds kind of flat when I just say it that way, but that's a, uh, been yeah. a big, big bone of contention is whether students who are typically minors have Fourth Amendment rights when they're at school. 
Um, so that was one component of what Yes Magazine called a major milestone in this court ruling. Um, and then another thing that sounds small, but is actually huge in terms of students' life chances beyond their time in school, um, the court ruled that the district, that any students who had been arrested under the previous policies had to have those arrests expunged from their, their right. records, right? Yeah. So that, that has huge impacts in terms of students' abilities to get jobs and, and all kinds of other things that hinge on having a clean record. Um, and all this was reinforced by five years of monitoring by the California Department of Justice. Um, so that's a story that we found got only local coverage, right? Um, uh, local papers and TV stations in, in and around Stockton certainly covered it, but it got no national coverage, despite the fact that as Yes Magazine reported, and as Amy, you mentioned when you introduced the story, the court ruling was basically a blueprint for how other schools could implement the same reforms to, to address in really meaningful ways this excessive and discriminatory policing of students and especially students of color. So I feel like that's an incredibly important story that really is very timely in terms of um, the current dialogue um, that, you know, the kind of reckoning that, that we were talking about a moment ago. Have there been outcome data from that school? Um, you know, Nick, not that I know of. Um, this is one that's probably ripe for us to do a deja right. vu updating on. Um, right. But off the top of my head, I don't know. It was, you know, it's only been, it's only been a little over a year and a, basically a year and a half now since the court ruling. But, you know, the initial, as I mentioned, the initial, just during the time the investigation was underway during that three-year period, there was this dramatic drop in the number of arrests. So, you know, I think at least the preliminary data was, was promising and encouraging. Amy? Oh, uh, do you, I mean, I have, some, I have some general questions about what corporate media is and is not. Oh, yeah, let's but, do it. Um, was, did you have further questions, Nick, about the contents of these? Oh, I, I I could go on. I have endless questions. I mean, this is this is just a this is a great opportunity. I'll just shamelessly plug again, like for anyone who's interested in more about these stories, the kinds of stories the project covered, either in this year's book or in yeah. previous years. Um, you know, they're all up on the Project Censored website uh, with the original with Project Censored summaries and then the links back to the original uh, independent news reporting that the summaries are based on. So. You know, let your curiosity uh, take you to projectcensor.org, and and I'm sure you'll find something there that is pertinent to um, whatever issues, public issues, you know, are near and dear to the to the podcast's uh, audience listenership. And perhaps discover some news sources you didn't know about that. You maybe, maybe some stories that will make you go, "Holy shit!" Right. I can't believe that's true. Well, or even, you know, stumble upon some, some publications. Oh, yes, yes, by all means. We do have at, at, at the one, another of the kind of links on the footer of the web page, uh, the home page of the Project Censored website is a link to some of the independent news sources that we regularly try to track and keep tabs on what they're up to. And some of those are, are general kind of... Um, in their, in, they cover any, anything and everything, and some of them are very specific to particular topical or subject areas. And um, yeah, there's just a wealth of information out there. But I think this is a nice time maybe to say, I think we, despite all of the challenges and the difficulties, despite the efforts by various powers that be to crack down on independent journalism, and this is everything from Facebook and Google and the algorithms that, that spit out the things we are interested in when we search for them to the cops, you know, shooting projectiles at journalists trying to re cover reports. Despite all of that, um, I think we live in probably the most, the best possible time in American history when it comes to the sheer volume of high, high quality independent journalism that's out there and available. The challenge is you just have to find it because there's so much out there that is, that is not high quality. And a lot of times the corporate media, which I know we wanna, you wanna talk about more in a moment, Amy, um, 
you know, the corporate, I, I have this, this, my, this image in my mind of the corporate media being kind of like a, a, one of the most prominent fast food chains, right? They're on every corner of, of, you know, every big city and they have huge advertising budgets. So they're very prominent. And, and the perception is like, oh, well, you can go there and get cheap food, right? Um, and then around the corner is like the farmer's market and there's no advertising budget for the farmer's market. And it's a little bit different here than it would be in Berkeley and than it would be somewhere else. And so you know, for some people that's uncomfortable. Um, and I really think uh, of news in terms of kind of a food metaphor, right? The big networks, the major cable stations to a lesser extent because they're not actually as widely read as um, the TV and cable stations are viewed. Um, those are like the big corporate entities that have that gobble up all the attention. And the perception is that, Oh, if I go to some, you know, rinky dink little independent outlet, I'm going to be propagandized or I'm going to be vulnerable to, you know, being fed fake news or whatever. Um, uh, but it's just, I think it's just not so. Well, I, require I think we want some kind of filter because if you go, terribly independent, then you're simply getting somebody's opinionated blog. And mm -hmm. it's hard for many people to know the difference. Right. So, yeah. I mean, part of what... Oh, oh, yeah, I was yeah. saying, give it a, oh, give an example. Uh, almost every day, Dalton, formerly the former idiot Dalton, tags me in a story in Twitter and asks, is this true? Uh-huh. Yeah. Great. So, I mean, what do we do with that? I, so here's what happens in some of the project censored classes that I was describing about, like where students, you know, the students who are identifying and initially, initially identifying and vetting some of the candidate stories for each year's top 25 list. Uh, when they're doing that work, we're setting them a known set of criteria to use to evaluate the, 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 the fitness, the quality of the news story. Um, so some of the basic elements of that are things like who or what are the sources? Who are they? Are they a diverse group of people and, and outlets? Are they narrow? Is, are there any to speak of? If there are none to speak of, right? If it's Andy's blog and Andy is telling you that the moon is made of green cheese and how do I know this? Because I do. Okay, that's an underreported news story. Um, but but it's a completely it, in the literal sense of the term it's an incredible news story because i have no evidence to provide um to support the claim right so we i often would tell my students look at the more the more outlandish the claims of the news story are the more rigorous the documentation of sources and evidence for that story need to be and i think that's a beginning point for any kind of evaluation of the credibility of a story is who are the sources? And I think that actually be beyond being a beginning point, that's also a way of getting into the more complex question of bias in reporting. Um, so one of the things that multiple studies that I've conducted throughout my kind of career since finishing grad school at UCLA, content analyses of news stories looking at who's quoted as an authorized source and looking at the range of people who are treated by journalists as newsworthy and comparing and contrasting independent and corporate versions of news coverage for who's treated by independent journalists and who's treated by corporate employed journalists as legitimate news sources and looking at the differences and looking at how those differences are then are the basis of uh, differences in the content of the news stories. Um, so I think looking at sources is something you don't need, like you don't need fancy college training to do that. Um, you can take any story, you know, it's easiest to do with print stories, but you can get transcripts pretty easily now of broadcast stories as well. Um, and look, just go through and circle every source, every quoted source in the story, whether it's a person or a document, um, and, and ask who are these people and do they represent a wide range of perspective? So we mentioned NPR earlier, um, you know, NPR does a lot of things really well, but I think on foreign policy, if you look at who NPR regularly treats as newsworthy sources, many, many, many of them 
on foreign U.S. foreign policy are State Department officials or former State Department officials. Does that represent a, a, a diverse view of the world, a diverse view of um, American foreign policy in the world? I, I think the although there is diversity of opinion within the State Department, in the bigger scheme of things, no. That's a fairly homogenous uh, set of perspectives from which to draw a news report. Yeah, I, I was going to ask. NPR because they're they're an interesting combination of um, listener supported and corporate supported. <laughs> I we're all on the corporate. Spectrum. Yeah, I'm glad we're having this conversation because I've been trying to encourage Amy to uh, branch out in her news consumption. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, I always think of news consumption again, like in food metaphors, like you can try doing something different for a week or two weeks. I would say this to students in my introduction to sociology course. I'd ask them, what are your news sources, right? And after we got through the awkward moment of a lot of people confessing that their news sources was their Facebook feed, um, and we can talk about why that's a problem if you want, um, you know, then I would say, okay, well, what happens if, if for two weeks you sign up to get uh, you know, a daily news thing from a, a daily news kind of briefing from three independent news sources that you don't normally listen to. Uh, and say you tell me you're too discouraged by the news to want to pay attention as much as you think you ought to, then I would say, let's, let's make Yes Magazine, which focuses on solutions, one of the three that you try. And just like with a diet, after two weeks, you may not have lost a lot of weight, but you might feel like you have a lot more energy right? And I think the same is true for news, um, that if you branch out, you can, you can kind of run an experiment of one on yourself and see, how do I feel? Do I feel more pessimistic about the world than I did when I was listening to nothing but Fox, right? Or do, you know, um, I, to go back to Amy's question, I think, I think the Corporation for Public Broadcasting sort of requires uh, uh, PBS and NPR, if we bring them together as both the, the radio and the TV versions of pub, what we have as public broadcasting in the U.S., um, I think that requires a historical perspective. Um, you know, back in the early 90s when I was in grad school, um, one of my mentors, Steve Clayman, um, turned me on to... Um, what was at the time, I think, the very best investigative journalism program on TV, which was PBS's uh, Frontline program, which is still running today. Um, in the early 90s, before the Newt Gingrich kind of revolution, um, um, the you know, kind of Republican-led defunding of, of public broadcasting, among other things, Frontline was entirely independently funded and the reports were incredibly hard hitting and they took on anyone and everything. Um, Frontline, as I say, is still runs and it's still better news reporting, investigative news reporting than almost anything out there. Um, but when you look at the topics now, I think, I think it's not as hard hitting. I think it doesn't cover as broad a range of topics as it used to. And I think that's directly tied to the fact that um, the front line, like all of PBS, is now much more reliant on corporate funding um, than it was in, than it was, uh, you know, in the nineties. And yeah, I've, so I've seen I, it. Happen I think that I think that I think that NPR is subject to the same pressures. Right. As a um, time listener, I've no actually noticed that trend. I've noticed that happen. Mm -hmm. It's gotten yeah. fluffier and fluffier. And I do, yeah. I do just Nick want to defend my myself against. Your your criticism early, because <laughs> bring Bert, let's bring it. Yes, I'm a fan of NPR, but no, it's not my only news source. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that NPR does great, yeah. but yeah. I think if you're talking about, say, like you know, if we go back a few years and talk about like NPR coverage of Ukraine, uh, or more recently NPR uh, coverage of Syria, like if you look at who. Who are the who are the NPR's authoritative sources on those topics? You'll find a preponderance of of U.S. government officials um, who don't who who give you maybe a very clear understanding of what the U.S. government's position is. Uh, but but the question is like, should our news give us more than the government's position, right? Um, yeah. And so I, what, I think one of the greatest examples of this, a guy who's kind of a hero to me. Um, uh, 
back in 2003, um, before, the, before the US military action against Iraq began, a guy named Darja Mail um, had a sense that things were gonna go sideways in Iraq, as I think a lot of people did. Dar was not a journalist. He had no background in journalism, but he just had a, a he, he felt compelled to go and see for himself on the ground what was gonna go down. So Dar hired an Iraqi driver. He went to Iraq, he went to Baghdad, he hired an Iraqi driver and an Iraqi translator. And while most of, you know, most quote, real journalists were embedded with US military forces when the invasion began, Dar was out there with his, his native uh, driver and translator talking to people who were not on the kind of rotations that the US military was taking the embedded journalists on. And so the stories coming back from Iraq were predominantly like, you, you know, the two of you probably remember them. There was yeah. like, you know, American journalists literally glorying in um, the sight of the rockets being launched uh, from, from the ships, the US military ships at sea uh, to, to bomb Baghdad. A lot and, of quote something Ted Rawl uh, said at the time, uh -huh. stayed with me because it's so pungent. He said, embedded journalists are whores. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty rough. Yeah. But Ted Rawls, <laughs> Ted Rawls a hitter, right? I yeah. mean, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ted Rawls, I got, you know, shout out to Ted Rawl who got fired from uh, the Los Angeles Times for calling it like he saw it. Uh, and the Times, which is, you know, in many ways a great newspaper, yeah, it couldn't deal with the heat that Ted Rawl was bringing. Um, yeah, um, uh, I should also say credit to, I mentioned earlier that Seven Stories Press is our publisher. Um, they also publish all of Ted Rawl's uh, books, which are fantastic and well worth looking into if that's someone whose work you don't know. Um, yeah, so while, while, you know, while the embedded reporters were reporting kind of what was official and while the TV networks were running the, uh, the military supplied footage of the rockets being launched, you know, Dar Jamil was there on the ground on the other end of things. And so the stories he told were radically different because the sources he was, he was connected to were very different. Right. Just, uh, just by random coincidence, now I'm reading uh, George Packer's book on Iraq, Assassin's mm. Gate. Uh -huh, yeah. And it's just breathtaking the extent to which the uh, U.S. government had no plans for reconstruction. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I it's, I, a, I, it's staggering. I will put on my conspiracy yeah. theorist hat yeah. and say I think the intent was to destroy the country so that uh, the petroleum and whatnot would be up for grabs, right? Which I know is a sort of very simplistic understanding, but I think I, but, I, it's hard to argue against it. Uh, I, I, I would argue against it because they, you know, they were not able to extract, uh, you know, they were not able to fund the reconstruction of the oil, which was the intent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. And once they started, you know, the, they actually went to the uh, extraction and refinery. They, you know, quickly figured out they were, you know, primitive. Mm -hmm. and so, right. I mean, I yeah, think, I think, yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't dispute any of what you've said, Nick. I, I yeah. guess I would just say I think uh, there's still room for the uh, a kind of imperial intent right. uh, combined with imperial arrogance to have <laughs> radically yeah. misjudged. Um, yeah, the yeah. difficulty of the task. And there were people not necessarily talking about it as a kind of colonial extraction operation, right. but there were certainly people back at the time. Um, it's just unfortunate that none of them were at prominent places like the New York Times saying like, this is entirely misguided. No one understands how, how complicated uh, the intervention here will be and right. how, how devastating it will be. Um, right. Uh, so some specific questions. Uh, one article was about how uh, Google News was suppressing LGBT voices and amplifying homophobic mm. assholes like Tony Perkins. Yeah, so that's actually, um, that's, oh, that's actually. I, 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 I had follow up. 
Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. The, the, the follow-up was that Google seems to have done a very good job creating an inclusive workplace for sexual minorities. Mm-hmm. And so, obviously, the recent you know the recent Facebook walkout show that you know tech workers you know will often protest what their overlords do, but it seemed very discordant in this in this case. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think there's the, there can be a difference between uh, the workplace conditions for people at an organization right. and what the organization does in terms of its its you know basically its public facing product. Um, so the research you're talking about there is research that I've uh, been conducting, kind of a longer term project that uh, project censored. Uh, colleague of mine, April Anderson, who's an information science librarian at McAllister College in Minneapolis. Um, April and I, starting with, um, we have a chapter in the 2020 book that's looking at um, newspaper coverage of LGBTQ issues, comparing corporate and independent newspaper coverage. And then out of that, uh, April, uh, got me to break from my kind of normal inclination to only look at newspaper coverage um, and to and because and begin looking thinking about the internet um, April got us focused on looking at what is basically what we think of as algorithmic censorship online and um, the the sort of one one reporting of our findings, one brief, succinct reporting of our findings has been published in the spring issue of the Index on Censorship. uh, I read read that. Yeah. In draft form, yeah. Right, yes, thank you. You read and commented on that, yes. Um, Which is, uh, so the Index on Censorship is a, a, you know, a highly venerated uh, London-based organization that, that focuses on um, censorship issues globally, and we were very, you know, very, uh, April and I were very pleased to publish a piece there. Um, it's a, considered a feather in, in each of our caps. Um, so the gist of that piece was that, yeah, a, a variety of these global online platforms from Google to Facebook uh, to TikTok, all in one way or another, um, are implicated in Um, suppressing positive content about LGBTQ issues and people and promoting, uh, ironically, at the same time, promoting uh, homophobic and transphobic content. Um, And so this is everything from we interviewed um, a a Bay Area lawyer named Peter Opstler, who is the who is the legal representative in a class action suit by uh, a number of LGBTQ YouTubers who are uh, bringing suit against YouTube for deplatforming their work on the basis of their uh, gender identities and sexual identities. Um, you know, I think the pandemic has delayed that case. Um, so I can't tell you uh, anything like a decision on it yet. Um, and it may also be that that case will ultimately rise and become a Supreme Court, um, argued before the Supreme Court. Um, the stakes in that case are huge. As Peter Opsler told me when I interviewed him, um, the only way that, that Google, which owns Facebook, can prove that they uh, haven't discriminated um, the way that the class action lawsuit claims is to is to reveal at least to uh, uh, third parties, uh, expert third parties who would be subject to all kinds of restrictions on what they could share, to reveal the algorithms that they use to to determine these flows. Um, and that is that good luck, is good luck with that. That well, if yeah. right, because if it. yeah, I'd love because it. if that yeah. came out, I think yeah. the whole house of cards uh, would come down. Um, so one of the things that April and I did for that index on censorship article is we were interested in how these uh, algorithms operate, and uh, we were inspired by a report we'd seen in a New York-based outlet called the Gay City News, where a reporter there had had basically spent a week using the Google News search engine in order to track what 
kinds of stories Google would return if you did a news search on search terms like LGBTQ and variants of that term. So uh, we conducted a week's worth of searches and found that in an inordinate percentage of the time, the stories that Google News was returning when you queried it for LGBTQ news, um, the sources were um, often from uh, highly conservative outlets, uh, very often from evangelical uh, religious outlets, places that you wouldn't necessarily even think of as news organizations. And so that's a kind of extraordinary finding. Right. Uh, we also thought like, well, let's check and see, um, is this true across the board? So we didn't, so we, we can, during the same week, we had conducted similar searches using, instead of Google News, using DuckDuckGo, which is uh, an alternative uh, news aggregator uh, or an alternative search engine that has its own news aggregator. And the findings uh, were dramatically different from what we found on DuckDuckGo, whereas 46% um, of the stories that were spotlighted by Google News came from conservative news outlets. Uh, just 6% of the DuckDuckGo LGBTQ articles derived from similar sources. Um, DuckDuckGo was much more likely to return uh, you know, what you might think of as mainstream U.S. news sources or international sources than Google was. So given the proprietary nature of the algorithms that generate, um, that, that work, uh, that drive those news aggregators, the Google news aggregator, um, it's impossible, I think, to judge whether the prominence of anti-LGBTQ stories is due to you know inbuilt biases in Google's algorithms, whether it's the result of skillful um, search engine optimization, so-called SEO, by uh, conservatives who have homophobic or transphobic agendas, or some combination of the two. Um, I recently heard a, a similar discussion in regard to racial bias. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I mean, our, our research, the, the research that April and I did is in some ways has been inspired by um, work by people like Virginia Eubanks, um, who wrote Automating, in a, a, Automating Inequality, a book that's uh, deservedly getting a lot of attention, and um, uh, another scholar, Safaya uh, Emojian Noble, whose uh, book Algorithms of Oppression also looks at the role of algorithmic bias in reinforcing racist practices in things like housing, uh, loans for housing and so forth and so on. Um, and what, what April and I were doing was kind of saying the same algorithmic biases exist with regard to LGBTQ people and issues. Uh, but for us, I mean, as we did a kind of literature review to try to um, inform ourselves of the terrain for our research, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be overly boastful, but I think no one else has really talked about this. Certainly there have been no major kind of book length scholarly studies of this the way there have been uh, uh, in, ter in terms of uh, algorithmic bias and, and race. Um, so the, the, the issues of gender identity and sexuality are ones that are, I think, uh, areas of great, you know, there's urgent need for more uh, more research uh, on those areas. And for people who are interested, um, I would point people to uh, Citizen Lab, which is a Toronto-based organization. Um, their, their web address is Citizen Lab, all one word, so citizenlab.ca. Um, and they have just, they're launching a, um, really an ambitious, amazing effort to um, track online censorship of LGBTQ issues. Um, they're a great organization in general, um, but that initiative would be of particular interest to people who are interested, as April Anderson and I have been, in how um, online censorship is affecting the LGBTQ community. Can 
now is a good time for me to ask. Should we do something? Give lob me a question if you would to that we can wrap up on. Uh, you mean to try to end with a? Do you want? To, I mean, I don't know how you guys usually end the podcast if you try to tie it up with a shiny bow or what, but. Um, I mean, I can tell you, I can tell you about what Walter Lippmann wrote a hundred years ago about journalism. I think that would be a great way to end. Okay. So uh, 2020 is the hundred year anniversary of a book that I think is still incredibly relevant today. Uh, in 1920, Walter Lippmann wrote the book Liberty, or published the book Liberty and the News. And Lippmann at the time was probably one of the United States' most prominent journalists. He would be, I think, by today's standards, a quote, public figure, a public intellectual kind of, uh, when it came to news and its role in a democratic society. Um, and in Liberty and the News in 1920, Lippmann proposed that there would be no, there ought to be no higher law for journalism than to quote, tell the truth and shame the devil. Um, and without going down a, a whole historical pathway of the historical context of 1920, um, suffice it to say that the devils that Lippmann had in mind weren't figurative ones. Uh, he was outspoken about uh, talking, you know, he, he named uh, propagandists and censors who, as he put it colorfully, uh, would put a painted screen uh, where there should be a window to the world, right? Um, and he felt that without a steady supply of trustworthy and relevant news, democracy would degenerate into, here's a dystopian vision for you, incompetence and aimlessness, dis corruption and disloyalty, panic and ultimate disaster. Even with COVID-19 and uh, a literally national unrest over police brutality and systemic racism. I don't think things are as bad as, uh, as Walter Lippmann uh, projected out from 100 years ago. But I do think that current events remind us um, of the vital importance of, of independent investigative reporting um, for our society, for us as engaged community members and for us as uh, informed citizens. I totally agree with that assessment, Andy, but as to whether Whitman was right, ask me on Wednesday, November 4th. <laughs> yeah, the, the flag that a neighbor is flying in our neighborhood says in big, huge letters, this is an enormous flag, right? Uh, it says, flush the turd on November 3rd. <laughs> <laughs> That's as good as the bumper stickers I saw 16 years ago that said, uh, lick Bush and Dick in 2004. <laughs> <laughs> Something for everyone, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Andy. This has been yeah. great. Thank, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Amy. Okay. Now I can hit the stop button.